Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Jason. Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome. Um, I hope you all got here OK. I'm Theo, and I just thought I'd start by giving you a very brief outline as to how the next hour or so is going to work. After just a little bit more about me, I'm just going to ask our esteemed panellists, Kate, Ollie Stewart and Juliet, to say a few words about themselves and the roles that they hold in the industry. And what a prestigious group we have. I must say on a personal note that I do feel privileged to have been asked to do this. Um, so we'll then have a short discussion around the theme of today's session, which is, of course, the publishing process before taking a few of your questions. So yes, I'm Theo. I'm a contract advisor at the Society of Authors, a union for writers of all disciplines and interests with around 11 and a half thousand members now. We've been advising writers and speaking out for the profession since 1884. Not me, of course, a relative novice. I'm now my fourth year on the staff. Prior to joining the SOA, I worked in publishing in various roles across sales, marketing and rights licensing. But enough about me. Kate, perhaps I can now pass the baton of introduction over to you to say a few words, perhaps naming some of the writers you represent, many of whom I'm sure we'll have read or heard about at least. Name dropping, actively encouraged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, my name's Kate Barker. I'm a literary agent. I run my own agency, which I, I'm, I'm quite new to this, really, um, although I've been in publishing for a very long time. Um, my uh, agency was set up I think about four years ago and clients I represent include um, the neuroscientist Gina Rippon who wrote a book for Bodley Head called The Gendered Brain, um, the MP Dan Jarvis, um, then on the fiction side I've got uh, novelists like Emily Gunnis who wrote a huge commercial bestseller called The Girl in the Letter which Headline published and they're going on with her, saga writer called Shirley Mann who I met at one of these conferences two or three years ago and I'm building a list of um, largely commercial fiction and quite serious non-fiction on the whole history, pop science, um, uh, psychology and so on. Um, before I've actually spent more time publisher side, I was an editorial director for Viking for ages. That was quite a long time ago because I could, took a career break with my children. Um, my youngest child is now 11. Um, and before that, I worked for Orion and I started out at Curtis Brown, which is kind of the complete opposite in terms of agenting. It's a huge agency. I think that's me. Well, thanks, Kate. What a full portfolio of experience there. Ollie from AM Heath, would you like to go next? Sure. Uh, my name is Ollie Munson and I am an agent and director at AM Heath and Co Limited, which is uh, a medium-sized agency of uh, 14 of us and we're 101 years old so we have lots of exciting contemporary clients like Maggie O'Farrell and Hilary Mantel but lots of very cool uh, older states as well um, up until last year we, we handled the George Orwell estate so there were lots of interesting requests coming in for the 1984 related material during Donald Trump's presidency um, and um, I primarily represent commercial fiction and um, that probably skews towards crime and thrillers and I've got a list of award-winning like Mari Hanna, Trevor Wood who won the debut at the CWA uh, awards last year and um, a little bit of speculative fiction in there as well with all those lucas. Well, thank you. Now jumping over the fence, Stuart from Verve. Yes, thank you. Um, yeah, uh, so Verve is a, a couple of things. It's a poetry press, it's a poetry festival. Uh, we're based in Birmingham, which um, makes us unlike almost all the publishers in the world. Uh, and uh, we're there for a reason, well I'm there anyway, but we're there for a reason which is um, that there's a really big poetry scene in Birmingham that um, wasn't getting published and also wasn't receiving um, visits from important poets. So, you know, that's what we did. We're a tiny press in that we've got less than one FTE working for us. So I do it part time and my friend Kibria does it part-time as well. 
um, although we are publishing about 20 poetry books a year. Um, if you know poetry, you'll know some of our poets. Uh, Luke Kennard's probably the most famous because he's also a novelist, um, but people like uh, Carrietta, people like Katrina Naomi have done pamphlets with us. Um, but we're very much, um, the thing about Verve, I think, is that we are quite a rare breed in that we, um, we're interested in performance and page poetry, so we don't uh, pretend one doesn't exist and only publish one. Um, we're as interested in show poetry as we are in um, very well thought out, structured, uh, written poetry. So we try and do everything and we're, uh, diversity is very important to us in terms of who we publish and also um, who we book for our festival. So that pretty much sums us up. Well, thank you, Stuart. And finally, Juliet from Blake Friedman. Hi, um, I'm Juliet. I am agent and director at Blake Friedman. Um, I've been there for seven years, so eight years now, I can't count anymore. Um, and I represent a really broad range of fiction and non-fiction. So my kind of bottom line is that it's often contemporary and often quite issue-led. I uh, didn't do a shiny PowerPoint, but I did bring some books just to wave in front of the camera to show you what I work with. So I have Sue Moorcroft, who's on the very commercial end of my publishing. She's my best-selling author and she writes romantic fiction for HarperCollins. Um, on the very other end of the spectrum, I have Dima al Zayat, who published her first collection of short stories last year and has been um, nominated for a couple of really wonderful debut writing awards. Um, on the narrative non-fiction side, I have this book published recently called Glossy, the inside story of Vogue. So I love kind of um, social histories and stories of crazy people, which this definitely is. Um, and I also have represent an incredible author called Kerry Hudson, who wrote a memoir of growing up in extreme poverty all over different towns throughout Scotland and England. And um, so that just shows a little bit, I hope, of the range of my list. I do a little bit of cookery as well. Um, and the only things I don't do are fantasy, crime, thrillers, that kind of thing. Well, thank you, Juliet. Thank you. And so to segue seamlessly into our discussion around the theme of today's event, and I thought it best if we follow a relatively linear narrative. So starting then at the very beginning, you know, and actually this, uh, you know, this goes back to what you were saying, Stuart, about your, you know, the diverse, your, your, the importance you give to, to your diverse and inclusive lists. And actually, I'm, I'm loving to see the love for Verve in the chat right now. Um, but could you perhaps just give us a little bit more about how you find the writers that you that you publish and um, yeah, what kind of avenues that you that you use to sort of find that talent? Yeah, OK. Um, so not agents, um, because um, poetry doesn't seem to be agented, is that a word? Um, and all, most of the poets I know with agents have agents for their fiction, but not for their poetry. And so they're allowed to go and make their own deals, um, which is quite, always quite interesting because they don't seem to know what they're doing. Um, but we're generous, so we don't please them. Um, we started off um, very focused on the West Midlands. Um, and we uh, literally, I was kind of walking up to people and going, <laughs> have you got a book? And if not, why not? And why don't we have do one? You know, it's that kind of business. Um, after a couple of years, that kind of dried up and we started having quite regular open submissions windows of about a month uh, where people can um, send us. And we tend to ask for fairly complete manuscripts. Um, and so I know some publishers ask for kind of samples of poems, but I always find I want to know what the other ones were. Um, so I find that quite difficult. So um, we do ask for complete manuscripts. Our last open window uh, closed at the end of March and we had 500 complete collections sent to us in a month. Um, so that shows you how many people are writing poetry. We're one of about a million presses. So, um, you know, it's amazing how much is going on in poetry in, in the UK. Um, so 
when, what I'm looking for is a mixture of things. I'm looking for great poetry. Um, I, I'm not judgmental about um, form or content in terms of, well, I'm a bit in content. I want things to be um, open, honest and embracing and outward looking is, is how I describe what I'm looking for in terms of poetry content. But I'm just as happy with uh, a rhyming kind of uh, stage type poetry as I'm with, uh, as I've said, in intricately written page poetry. Um, I think um, I'm looking for a lot from our poets. We're a tiny press, so we can't do, you know, we don't have any money. We can't pay for adverts. We can't um, buy coverage. Um, so we really are, uh, we, re we kind of build a collaboration with our poets. We don't charge them to publish with us um, and we do pay royalties, but we do expect our poets to be energetic and serious about their poetry. Um, and we expect them to engage with social media um, and the outcome is always better if that side of things is recognised by the writer. That useful? Absolutely, thank you. And Kate, so you're relatively new to the agency game, but you've obviously been in the industry for a long time. How do you go about finding your, your list? It's uh, different for fiction and for non-fiction. Um, with non-fiction, I just tend, tend to write to people that I think look interesting, which I think is what most agents do. Um, somebody might crop up in the, in the news. Um, I'm not really a sort of Instagram agent, so I tend not to scroll through Instagram looking at who's, that's just not my bag. Or uh, people give talks and so on. So the non-fiction, more often than not, is writing to people. Sometimes it's recommendation, actually. Uh, my existing clients, some of whom are academics, will say you should look at so and so. They're really interesting. With the fiction, it's almost all. Um, it's it's um, people who come in, just send their submissions in. I've just taken on one commercial um, commercial fiction writer um, who uh, I can't tell you anything about it because mm -hmm. we're going to change the title and all sorts of things. It's in very early days, but it's women's fiction. Um, and then I tend to work. I like working editorially with my clients a lot because I feel that's where I can add value. I've got, I was an editor for a very long time and I've ghostwritten. So I know how to do that. So it tends to be just sort of doing events like this, spreading the word um, and hoping that people will send me their material. Yeah. So Juliet, I can come to you now. So what, if, can you give us a little bit of an outline as to what that process looks like when your interest is peaked from an agency perspective. What then happens in terms of the manuscript itself and actually your role in, you know, selling that into the market? Sure. Um, that's, that's quite a big question. So there's a lot there. Yes. Um, but Do you break it down? Of course. So when I read a submission, so that first three chapters, say, of a novel, and I'm excited about it, I'll write an answer for the full manuscript. I will try to read that as soon as I can um, and I will also ask someone else within the agency to read it alongside me and um, so I have their view on it as well but I am quite selfish in that if I love something I will take it on regardless <laughs> um, and I will also perhaps sound out my colleagues who represent our translation rights so when I take on a new book I will represent it in the UK and also in the US where I send out directly but we also have colleagues who send our books out for Brazilian, Japanese, French rights, all sorts of things and we have a media team who look for TV and film opportunities so often I might sound a book out with them at the early stages particularly if that author has lots of agents after them and I have to compete with others. Um, and then I will talk to the author, of course, tell them I'm excited, ask to meet, which in usual times would be face to face wherever possible. But obviously now we're doing so much on Zoom. Um, but I feel that meeting is super important to, you know, listen to their ambitions for the book and for themselves as a writer to make sure that we click, that we get on as two human beings, but also um, that we hopefully will get on in this potential business relationship. And then that is when I kind of talk through my editorial thoughts on the book. So I will, you know, come to them with ideas perhaps about structure or character or pulling a particular 
narrative thread to the fore a little more and I will discuss that with them you know we don't present edits as a fait accompli like you have to do this or I don't work for you it's very much a collaboration it's very much about listening to what the author wants for the book and it's my role as the agent to be that market perspective so when you ask about taking a book to market I'm already anticipating where that book might go when I submit it to publishers so I won't go on too much on that question because one of the others might want to answer that too. <laughs> well, I was going to say, do, does that all sound very familiar for you, Oliver? Uh, yeah, that's, that's how it's done. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> She's right. Absolutely on the money. Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and I guess everyone has their own, uh, their own style and their way of presenting to, to, to potential authors. But yeah, that that is the the model of 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 how we work, and by getting other people in the agency to read the work and to get your foreign rights department, media department, if you have one, to get involved early on, it does help your cause. If there's other people, uh, other agents interested, because you can say, look, we're we're, we're a united front here, and we're going to be all going into bat for you. You're not just getting one agent; you're getting several. Mm. Yeah. So once you find um, a buyer for a work, Ollie. Um, what kind of things, from a writer's perspective, would would you then expect? W would it be a question of receiving? I don't know. I mean, does the auction apply here, or 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 is that is that is the author then presented with a contract, or, or what what does that kind of process look like when you've actually eureka? You know, you've you've reached the eureka moment. You've managed to manage to pique an interest, an offer, basically, from a publisher. Sure. Well, if you've got one offer, then you have to hustle to find leverage to make it a better offer. Yeah. If you have two offers, you can probably have a little auction. And if you have more than two offers, you can have or three offers, four offers, you can have a good auction and, and see where that takes you uh, in mm. terms of the finances. And yeah, I, I think we all make it quite clear in an auction situation that it isn't the money alone that determines um, where an author ends up. I mean, let's be realistic, often it is, but um, marketing plans are important and obviously the general vibe between the author and the editor um, and the other people they've been introduced to because a smart editor will have done what a smart agent has done and looped in their publicity teams, their marketing teams, international sales teams maybe, um, to, to again present that united front. So yeah. that decision is made on a number of factors um it's all systems go and that's when the 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 contract is signed and the the editing gets underway mm. and and do you um juliet you mentioned that you had a you know quite a bit of back and forth with the writer on the editorial side does that also apply to the contract or do, is it generally the case that the agent will be take care of those kind of negotiations and then present the sort of final deal to the author it can really depend on the book um so once the offer is made in the first instance the uh, editor might present a, what's called a deal memo which is a kind of set of basic terms at that point or they might wait until a little bit later down the process and give you a deal memo later on i usually ask for it before final stage so we know what we're negotiating with as well as the advance um and it can really depend on the author. So for example, if they are Australian and Australia is their local market, you might want to work on improving their home market royalties because you know they will work hard to sell their book locally. Um, mm. Recently, for example, very different, I had a cookbook and I was negotiating ingredient fees and photography and that sort of thing as well. So that's very specific to the book itself. Um, with fiction, I will always be, you know, well, across all my books, I'll be as transparent as I can be with the author about what's being offered, what they're agreeing to, you know, where I've improved things. Um, and if there's anything that's particularly important to them, then we always discuss that before we accept any final offer. So they understand the final offer that they're accepting before we say yes. Yeah. And Stuart, you mentioned you were a relatively small outfit with limited financial resources. Is there anything that you find is particularly important from a writer's point of view when they're when you offer them a contract or an arrangement to publish? Um, no, most most poets just want to be published, and uh, and they're not expecting to earn very much anyway. 
I think, I mean, we, we decided we wanted to be, uh, we try and be fair. And I think our contract generally is more generous than most in that we uh, give about 20% of RRP to poets who, if we sell their book direct from our website, you know, those kinds of things. Um, we don't give advances. We're look, talking about hundreds of pounds uh, max for most uh, poets. Um, but I think what, what I do find is um, quite a, a lot of thought about ownership. And, you know, we get lots of questions about, particularly about uh, length of contract. We get a lot of that. And we get, mm -hmm. I mean, I noticed someone on the chat's talking about um, Society of Authors. And um, quite a few of our poets talk to you guys um, when I show them the contract. And it says, you know, we want to keep your poems forever. Uh, and so it's, you know, it's, I think there's a lot of interest from from people around what they're giving up and um, what control they'll have in the future over their work, which is which is fair and um, quite interesting as well. Um, but I know, you know, the, the thing about the poetry market, and I suppose it does extend to um, kind of uh, smaller indie publishers of other stamps as well. Is is just how uh, being such a tiny business changes publishing, changes how you publish, and changes. You know, the, we'd never use the word departments. Yeah, you know, it's not something we have. We, I'm the department for everything, and it's a very different. Feels like a very different beast to um, the kind of business you get at the other end, which I do know because I've, I've worked for Wolfstones for thirty years, so I've, I've seen all sides of. Um, of the industry um but i think what's interesting for me about indie publishing is just the extent to which it's outside of um, the normal economics uh, most of our sales are via a website or via events probably only a third go through bookshops at all so you know you are mm. dealing we're not particularly reflected very well on nielsen book data uh, no one really knows what's happening in in the publishing in terms of sales so. Mm. And Kate, you have considerable experience at a completely different, you know, uh, an, an outfit that's right at the other end of the spectrum. Um, has that sort of, does that change the way you negotiate with your publishers or has that given you sort of particular insight into how, how deals can be structured, for example? I think it's, um, I think probably not massively in terms of the way deals can be structured. That I think, it, I think the insight it really gives you in, in the key insight it gives you in, is into how publishers actually work big publishers actually work from the inside and what needs mm. to happen and how to sort of in this is the thing that authors often struggle with and it's part of the role of the agent is when the publisher says this what do they actually mean and it's not in terms of the um not even just in terms of the words like selling and things like that which you know the number of shop books going into the shops but the sort of code you can read in um, sort of reading between the lines actually what are the aspirations for this book what are they going to do is everybody really pulling out all the stops or is there are people just sort of slightly coasting a little bit and I think the ability to be able to do that to see what's really going on I found very useful mm. Um, mm. yeah but I mean yes it's a world away from you know um a, a, a tiny poetry publisher which sounds idyllic in yeah. many ways although i'm sure it's very challenging uh, <laughs> yes. it? um, but i mean i, I mean i you, the question was about big and small publishing wasn't it a rich, uh, i think and i think you know there's a, a a lot to be said for working with a very small publisher because you know you are then a big fish big fish in a very you know small pond and in a way, if you're a, a literary author at one of the big houses, it can work fantastically. Mm. You know, the, the big houses are unparalleled when they're really going for it. They've got the international reach, the sales reach, they can get supermarkets. The whole weight of the house go, can get behind the author and then it's, an, it's extraordinary. But if you don't mm. quite, you know, if you're sort of in third, second or third tier, actually, I think you might get slightly better service perhaps at a smaller publisher, even down to little things like um, each each imprint will only be allowed to submit a certain number of books 
for a literary prize. Mm. If you're at a hugely prestigious literary list, there may be five authors who are definitely going to be submitted and your book won't. Whereas if you're at a tiny or smaller press, you stand a much better chance of being the, so the wild card on the, the women's prize long list, for example. Mm. So the big mm. small publisher thing can work, you know, either, either can work very well. Yes, yes. Thank you. And Juliet, you mentioned the editorial process that you had with your authors. Is that then something that gets picked up and taken forward by the publisher that you sell into? Are you then expecting them to make additional editorial changes? Um, and what is the level of the, the author's involvement on that? Is that all always requested from the author or do the publishers expect to be able to edit that work however they please? No, so it's a similar process to the one I talked about between agent and author. So yeah. if a publisher puts an offer on the table for a book, I will then introduce the editor and the author and probably some of the editor's colleagues to the author as well. Um, so they can hear about the editorial work that the editor is proposing doing with them. It's not done for them on the, or on their behalf. It's very much, again, that collaboration. And they'll also meet marketing and publicity quite often. So they get an idea of the planned campaign for the book when it's going to be published. Um, so mm -hmm. it's a slightly unusual thing of you work quite closely with your author from the point that you take them on up until the point that you get the contract sorted, essentially. And then as an agent, you take a bit of a step back and the primary relationship for that book becomes between the editor and the author. And the two of them work closely on shaping the book into the best possible shape. And I, I said this to one of my one-to-one -one writers yesterday, I said to all of my authors, you will be like thoroughly sick of working on your book by the time it's published. Um, well, by the time it goes off to print, really. And then, you know, it's published and you have to talk about it for a year. So it's good to know your book inside out because you will do by the point that it's published. Um, but yes, the editorial and, you know, the editorial authorial relationship is very much that collaboration mm. again. And it's about listening to each other and working together to publish the book that you both want to put out into the world. Yeah. So, Ollie, for a slightly different spin on this, then, what to what extent does that apply to the subsidiary rights, those secondary rights that you might represent on behalf of the author? So, the translation rights, the film rights, the audiobook rights. Um, what, how involved is the author in that process? In terms of what other requirements or demands? from the publishers to say, well, hang on, we need some flexibility in order to change and edit this, this author's work? Or to what extent is it, is, does it reflect the, the situation that Juliet was just describing and that the author's views are respected, any changes come back to them for their comments and they're involved in that process? I think Quite um, you, when, you, when you sell books into uh, translation markets, ideally you want a translator that's going to be badgering the author with questions because if they're asking the questions it's because they want to make sure they're getting the nuance absolutely right. It's a bit of a worry if um, if, they, if they ask you nothing and suddenly the, the book appears on German shelves. You know, you can't be convinced it's, uh, you know, you, unless you speak German you don't know what the translation of your book reads like, essentially. Yeah. So I think there's a it's a it's a huge act of faith selling rights to a a foreign publisher uh, for translation purposes because you don't know how much of that is going to be the translator's voice or your voice as you intended and I expect it's you know on a good day probably ninety percent your voice but it's always going to be a little bit maybe ten percent the translator's voice as well it should be because a good translator can add a lot um, film adaptation is different altogether you're sort of you know, you can you can you can sign on as a producer. If you've got the chops, you can maybe write the script or write a draft of the script and get paid for it. But at the end of the day, it's um, adaptation, and um, you're not going to have a huge amount of input necessarily. But um, again, I think you have to um, just appreciate that it's a different art altogether, and and, and enjoy it mm -hmm. those terms. If you're lucky yeah. enough to get. A lot of books get optioned and not yeah. as many as uh, get made as you might think. Absolutely. 
And Kate, it was so interesting to hear that about the distinction between the larger houses and the smaller houses. So in terms of production support, moving on from editorial support, but into the terms of the production, you know, the, the cover design, um, any kind of the front matter, all this kind of additional production design work. Is that something, again, that would generally be passed by the author or would the publisher expect to say, well, actually, we're the people that have the sort of commercial acumen here. We're the guys that really need to package this and make sure it sells. Um, I mean, this is a conversation that we've all had on one side of the table or the other many, many times. Yeah, I mean, the, the um, ultimately, as the publishers call the cover that goes on the book and the, the standard argument the publisher uses is the author doesn't like it, but the author is the only person who's definitely not going to buy the book on the strength of the cover. You know, do you know what I mean? Yeah. But I think in practice, what I've found actually is that publishers don't want to upset their authors. Uh, maybe I've just been lucky. Um, they don't want to try and impose covers on authors that the, the author hates. I mean, I've had to have several sort of quite involved conversations so far about why the author doesn't like it. But generally, ultimately, I think we all get mm. to the point where we think maybe this isn't the right thing and we try something else. And that's been across all sort of sizes of publishers, um, in fact. Um, and I mean, they all, they, the bigger publishers do have in-house designers, but they frequently use freelancers as well. And often actually the people I found that the people who are freelancing for small houses actually sometimes work for the big houses during the day. You see what I mean? So it's, it winds up being the same people quite often. Yeah. Yeah. And how does that kind of process look for you, Stuart? Of, uh... Uh, yeah, it varies a bit. Um, we tend to, we have an in-house graphic design department. Uh, you're looking at it. Um, and I think <laughs> probably, <laughs> uh, probably not the best, but you know, um, but um, I do, I do covers collaborative poets and it depends on Sometimes they'll come with a cover they know they want. Um, sometimes it will be a nice cover and we'll go with it. Um, we'll have the whole spectrum, really. We, we very rarely fight. And, the, and a kind of my editorial process generally is to say what I think. But if it, if it doesn't agree, they get their way. Often that's the way we go anyway. And, and it has been that way a couple of times with covers. Um, I, quite, I will come back and say, told you so sometimes. I don't think um, covers and poetry is quite so important. I think uh, the house, uh, uh, the poems, the poet, um, probably then the cover in that order. It's quite a dis yeah. uh, an interesting economy, as I say. Um, as a bookseller over the years, covers from all the publishers in the world can can vary horribly, and and there's mm -hmm. as many. That are lovely as a awful aren't there and so, so it's one of those things that um i think for me it's about um what, what i aim for with my poets is that they have a book they love um and i wouldn't pick them as a poet if i didn't already love their work so the work we do on it is just to make it as good as it can be and to look as good as, as it can be but they have to love it because of the big role they're going to have in mm. showing it around yeah, and I think the, the the final area really that it'd be so great to hear from you all on is the area of um, social media. So an author's social media profile, not only in terms of promoting the book once it's published, but equally to what extent does that really, um, is that significant when you're looking for writers, when you're looking to see whether you can make a, a book budget properly? you know, have they got a sufficient following for this to work? Have they got a readership, a natural readership that they can, that they can help with here? Or is there some kind of marketing pull or value they can bring to the collaboration to actually, you know, to, to, to kind of marry up with your own promotional work and to, to make, you know, fundamentally to make a project work that maybe wouldn't otherwise. Is that something that you've come across, Stuart, at all? Or the, the role of the, the poet in the sort of social media world? Yeah, um, I think it's, um, again, it, I, I, it's very much case by case. I think some people are very active on social media, but it doesn't help their book at all. 
Um, other people are quite quiet on social media, but they find other ways of connecting people with their book. I think the key key element, and it's not always about social media, but it's about um, energy and connectivity, and, and there's lots of different routes for that. Um, mm. If a poet's going to lots of events and reading and showing people their book in person, that can often be just as good as, as being rampant on social media. And then also just the risk of, uh, I guess, still quite amateur people um, trying to have a pro social media profile that works and not everything mm. does work. Not everything a person decides to put up is the best thing for them to put up. So it is about, um, mm. you know, I, I worry about relying exclusively on that. But, you know, on the other side, um, social media is free advertising if it's done well it's it's vastly powerful yeah yeah and ollie is that something you've noticed at am heath uh, the social media um yeah i think it depends on the author and it depends on the genre in which they're writing um i think it's more important for uh writers of non-fiction to perhaps have a profile if, if, if the aim is for that profile to sell books um, I think that Instagram I read some of that Instagram is effective but only if the book that's produced is tying into uh, the Instagram person's um, brand if you see what I mean so having yeah. followers isn't enough there has to be a reason for people to have been following that person in the first place mm -hmm. Otherwise, you're not going to get the sales you might expect with. Um, I don't think Twitter sells books. I think Twitter is a vile, busted flush. Um, mm. And I dislike it enormously. Um, and I think there's much better ways for people to um, discuss books and, and share recommendations in, in maybe smaller communities um, of yeah. like minded stuff. Yeah. Does that resonate with you, Julia? That's, that's just my personal. Yeah. That's my personal view on it. Yeah, yeah. That the um that that social media can can be used, you know, by book clubs, by the readers themselves to build community, but perhaps it's less of a marketing promotional value add from the author's point yeah. of view. Yeah, publishers like it because it's yeah. cheap. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Does it, it's the illusion of doing something sometimes, you know. Yeah. Does that resonate with you, Juliet? Uh, yes, very much. I think it's absolutely true that for nonfiction, particularly, as a platform somewhere can help if you're writing a particular kind of nonfiction. And um, so, if you are writing as the authority on a topic, it really helps if you're known somewhere accessible as the authority on that topic. So, you might be a journalist writing about uh, women's issues. You might be you might have a really successful Instagram platform for cookery, you know, those things can count for a lot. In fiction, it's much trickier to place a value on social media. I think it entirely mm. depends at the moment on your generation, who you're writing for. Um, and particularly in the last year, social media has become so important as we lose actual face to face events. So although I was very much minded to say to writers, do what makes you comfortable and don't worry about having a social media presence, um, particularly for fiction. I do think it's quite smart at the moment to at least have those accounts, even if you don't use them all the time. You know, I'm not asking you to do that, but you might need to do an Instagram live to launch your book at some point. You know, it's all we've got at the moment. So mm. I think it's a good thing to equip yourself with, but it's not absolutely the be all and end all. Um, yeah. Yeah, thank you. And just to bounce this one finally over to you, Kate. I mean, I think um, I'd, I'd second what everybody has said. I think, um, that, I mean, there's a real tension with fiction, isn't there, for novelists, because all the time that you're spending on social media is time that you're not spending writing uh, your next book. And I think you'd be, you'd, you'd spend your time more profitably writing something else or, you know, writing a, uh, I, I, I think, you know, that there are some people who are very, very good at social media, 
at throwing it out there and that's great and that's effective and if it's if you're really good at that and it doesn't take up a huge amount of your time and you enjoy it then then go for it but if you hate it i think that will come across and so what's the point you really might you might uh be better advised to spend your time thinking about well actually can you write an author can you write an author piece um uh, for a specialist publication or or the local press or something like that or even pitch it to you know get it pitched to the national press and that will probably Mm. more be more effective than a few half-hearted tweets which you'll find quite embarrassing um yeah Yeah. non-fiction as as juliet and ollie both said is is very different because publishers are looking for a platform but that might not be this the social media platform and if it is you're probably going to be a sort of semi-professional instagrammer with hundreds of thousands of followers your platform might equally be the fact that you're a professor of neuroscience somewhere or you know you have built a multi-million dollar business so your platform could can, can, can also mean your credentials and things like that mm. uh, your, your professional or academic credentials yeah yeah Gosh, I, I recognise myself in the um, in the the few sort of random tweets that you that you mentioned. Um, I have tried it, but I'm not a I'm not on the platform. Anyway, so Jason, do we have any questions that we can now put to the panelists from we the floor? We do indeed. So just give me a second. I'll go and try and take them from the the top. Uh, so I'm just scrolling back through for the moments. And yep. Got when it. is oh, so? Somebody asked a quite specific one. When's the next? submission window for verve ah well oh, Stuart, would you like to answer that one yeah i'll answer <laughs> that i think i'm the best equipped for that question uh, yes. yeah uh, it'll be um same time next year uh for the month of march okay brilliant yeah. thank you very much um a, one bit more extensive i think do you have any advice on how to pitch memoirs to agents ah um, who would like to take this, Kate? Sure. I mean, um, I imagine Juliet would have some things to say as well. Memoir's sure. tricky because what uh, what we hear. I love memoir, and there there are some amazing memoirs out there at the moment. What publishers have been saying of late is that if you aren't famous in some way memoir tends to be extremely difficult to sell unless it's very literary um so in terms of pitching it to to did sort of it, it, as always it depends what sort of memoir it is um but i think you need to find something that showcases your um your your persona and your writing in, in the shortest possible way and i think probably the things for me that are essential in a submission generally would be just think very carefully about how you're pitching this when in your covering letter um i think people tend to talk about themselves far too much in covering letters unless unless they're citing obviously the sort of academic credentials or whatever it is um just think about think about what would be the blurb on the back of this book and and think very carefully and write that very carefully and make and sort of foreground that when you're sending it to the agent and of course you know look at what else the author the agent the kinds of book the agent represents that's the key thing if they don't do memoir at all then i, I look elsewhere yeah now juliet you're sharing some news with us earlier i'm not sure if it was confidential or not which is why i haven't repeated it but uh yeah that's no, fine <laughs> yeah um, so diane abbott's memoir yeah so yeah yeah so the last memoir i sold was diane abbott's which is a nice thing to be able to say um yeah. so yes i agree with kate memoir can be really hard. I mean, I think there's so much being published and so much in the pipeline that it's very hard to find something unique. Um, And I think that's the thing to use when you write to agents is what is your USP? What's extra special about your story? Um, And I think there's still an appetite for sort of memoirs around nature and those sorts of subjects. But again, I think it'd be really smart to go and look at what's being published. And if you see a kind of plethora of titles that are not dissimilar to yours, be really distinct about what makes yours stand out, because that will we will need that to pitch to publishers and they will need that to pitch to retailers. They essentially have to say this story hasn't been heard in this way before. Mm. 
There's, Thank you. Um, Congratulations on yourself. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, Jason. Sorry, no, no, no. I, I'm just checking that nobody else thinks once because there's a couple more questions that have come through. Um, what advice would you give to someone currently researching fiction agents? Are there any huge do's and don'ts when contacting possible agents? I think you probably covered some of this, but are there any key pointers, that, quick takeaways yeah. that you could offer? Ollie, how would you like oh, to go? Uh, I would say just make sure that when you're looking at the uh, list of agents at an agency that you pick the one that represents the kind of book that you're writing. I think that's a very basic thing that, that um, sometimes people get wrong. I sometimes get children's submissions, which is insane because we've got an excellent children. It isn't me. Um, make sure you get the person's name right. Um, if there's anything you can say in your, in your covering letter, and you know, don't underestimate how important that covering letter is when it comes to uh, you know, piquing our interest and getting our attention. So make sure that you yeah, talk about the writing experience you've had, where relevant, make sure you, um, you know, say, say why you think that your book would be a good fit for that agent. Um, feel free to compare your work to, to other books in the marketplace, let the agent know where you think it would sit in the marketplace. And you can do all things like that without sounding arrogant uh, and it displays a good amount of market savvy. Thanks. There's also then so another couple of questions coming through. Um, when pitching, <clears throat> this one's quite specific, when pitching nonfiction science to an agent, is demonstrating academic writing as well as more general writing helpful? Um, Juliet, did you have anything on that yeah. too? Um, yeah, I mean, I think anything that you can say about any other published writing, um, academic writing included, uh, and if any success in short story competitions or, you know, anything like that on a cover letter for any writer can be helpful just to let us know that someone else has thought your writing is a bit special, basically. Um, so if you've done academic writing or you've been published um, in that arena, then by all means mention it. I think, you know, I have a couple of authors who write you know, commercially. So they write for mainstream audience, but they're also publishing academic articles and theses and that kind of thing. So absolutely mention it. That's fine. Just keep it short and snappy. <laughs> yeah. Kate, were you involved with the Puffin series that came back to Penguin a few years ago? Puffin? No, I, I did um, adults. I only did it. I've only yeah. done adults. Books. But on the, yeah. um, the non-fiction, on the pop science thing I'd say absolutely include reference to your academic writing because one of the things that serious pop science serious popular science publishers will want to know is is um about your your own acad your own research they'll want to know what is original in this book that couldn't have been written um possibly in a much more accessible way by a, a journalist you know why should and, and if you've published on that subject in an academic journal then that's absolutely part of your platform that's really important um so you should mention it i mean obviously you'll need to tailor your writing so what if you if you've written something in, a, in an academic journal that's probably not going to work exactly in a in a, a, a trade book but it's not that much of a leap from the academic to the trade so absolutely talk yeah. about it Thanks. I'm sorry, I meant Pelican, not Puffin. Uh, Jason. Oh, no, no. Yeah. yeah. All right. Yes. Um, a couple more here. Uh, so if someone decides to take the self-publishing route first, can they still submit their manuscript to agents? This is something that we haven't touched on at all, the self-publishing industry, which is obviously uh, increasing in size and scope from our experience. Um, self-publishing, and this is the question that we asked quite often does it damage your chance of getting that sort of holy grail of a publishing deal or an agents that many many writers aim for um ollie what do you think uh, i don't think it does hinder your chances i think if you self-publish something and you sell three copies then you don't really need to mention it just take it down and never speak of it again 
And if it sells 300,000 copies, then shout it from the rooftops. That'll get people interested. But I think, yeah, yeah I, I, guess, I guess, if nothing else, it's a way of testing market reaction, isn't it? Um, but just, but yeah, I don't want people to put too much pressure on themselves either, because just because it's easy to put a book up on a platform doesn't mean it's easy to market the book once it's on that platform. Mm -hmm. And you might have a book that doesn't catch fire, not because it's a poor book, but because you know the person isn't the best marketeer in the world and the marketer in the world, and that's absolutely fine. You know, that's not their job. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, no. Oh, sorry. No, if there are any yes. other comments, sorry, before I jump in. No, sorry, do, do, do throw another question, yes. Okay, yeah. yep. Um, let's get to a few more. Here's an interesting one, which I've never even considered before. Do agents yeah. and publishers feel offended when writers send contracts to the Society of Authors for a check, or is it expected <laughs> in the Ooh. industry? <laughs> right, move, next question. <laughs> no, 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 let, let's, be, let's have a great out discussion about this. Um, Stuart. <laughs> no. Uh, no. It's a no, bit annoying. Really but yeah, no, it's fine and I understand why they do it. I normally know what they're going to say, so uh, it, it's fine. It's just part of how it goes. It's always interesting to know what the Society of Authors are telling people, so it's quite a good way of finding out the latest. Mm. I expect it uh, I've never you. withdrawn a contract for that reason. <laughs> Great to hear. Juliet? <laughs> Um, no, I think, you know, the whole point of having an agent is so that you don't need something like Society of Authors necessarily, um, because the agent should, as part of their skill set, be able to negotiate the best contract for you. And they are also, you know, only earning when the author earns, so they're trying to negotiate the best contract for them as well. <laughs> so, um, you know, it should be in everyone's interest. But, you know, should, if any of my authors did that, and some of them have occasionally run it past a lawyer and that kind of thing after I've sent them a contract, totally understandable. You want to know that you're signing something that you can trust. So I wouldn't take it personally or be offended, but I'd hope that they felt that they could trust my judgment on it. <laughs> And uh, Ollie, <laughs> um, I, I Sorry, would say answer. if I've if I've if I've started representing somebody who perhaps was rep, uh, published directly by a smaller press that I hadn't done business with um, in the past, yeah. I would sometimes want them to. I would like to think they have checked those terms because sometimes you see contracts and people just don't know what they're signing, and I think for certainly unagented authors, of, of whom there are many, um, the Society of Authors is an excellent backstop, a really good port of call. And Kate, the Society of Authors, a force for good? Question mark? Absolutely. 100%. How, how, um, how could it not be? Yeah. <laughs> um, there's a couple more specific questions coming in as well. Yes. Um, so one for Stuart, are you looking for poetry for children too? Uh, not at the moment. Um, it's, it's a bit of a blind spot for Verve. Uh, we did our first festival or two had um, a children's element to it and it was really hard to pitch um, because we just had all the children with different ages and wanted different things and it became a bit of a minefield. Uh, the Emma Press uh, in Birmingham are a very good poetry press who do a lot of work with children's poetry as well. So um, we kind of feel that's covered in our area a little bit. They're really good. Um, so they're the press I'd recommend for that kind of thing. Um, but I'm not saying never. We may come back to it. Okay, thank you. Um, a more general question. Do you work with authors who use pseudonyms or are otherwise recluses? Sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh. There. I just love that phrase. Do you work with authors who are recluses? Would William Wordsworth get a job with any of you? <laughs> yes, and, and a, an interesting sort of side note here is, is what value, I mean, do publishers see an additional value in publishing someone that uh, uh, maybe a celebrity that is using a nom de plume as, as J.K. Rowling did, for example. Uh, Juliet? I think if you're a celebrity using a nom de plume, that's very different to being a non-celebrity yeah. using a nom de plume. Um, yeah. You know, 
I don't represent huge celebrities, so I'll let someone else answer that. Um, but I would say, you know, pseudonyms are employed if an author who has perhaps previously been published might want a change of direction. So they might be wanting to write for a slightly different genre. Um, or, you know, their publishing has become a little bit stuck. So we might think, right, we want to revamp you and we don't want everyone to look at your last sales and think, oh no, we can't carry on with this author. Um, and usually that's because the writer is terrific and we want to give them more opportunities. So we might look at, you know, using a different name for that reason. Um, mm. On the question of being a recluse, <laughs> I think, you know, it's it is hard if you're going to be completely reclusive and not do any events, have no online presence. To be completely honest, you know, that is can be a deterrent to you agents and to publishers because we want the author to help us take their book out into the world and to stand next to it and be proud of it. And, you know, there are authors and very, very successful authors who hate the limelight. And so what they tend to do is sort of drag themselves out for a few months around publication and then gratefully retreat again to write their next book. It can be a challenging industry in that respect, the kind of expectation to be a bit sociable. Um, you can probably make it work as a total recluse, but those are one or two authors in every sort of 50 perhaps. Um, and it was certainly ring a few alarm bells for me if an author sent me something I loved it and they were they were like but I want to be completely anonymous and I don't want to do any publicity that is very hard I think to really kind of make a success of mm. and Kate can we come to you on that one it, it is Kate isn't it yes yes um the um I think I mean I I think it's absolutely true that uh, events are important, although, you know, we've all been quite reclusive over the past year and we've, we've all adapted. I think, I mean, it depends on your genre, but I think if you are a commercial writer who wants to be very reclusive, then you might be, you might find yourself more comfortable with a digital publisher, actually, because they don't, for obvious reasons, uh, send their authors off on uh, events very often. And while they do like to do things like Facebook Live and, you know, um, use social media differently, that can be done in a much more sort of controlled, managed way. Um, and you could even, you know, create your own persona who isn't actually you on social media. And you can craft that in a way that you can't do it, do in person unless you're an extraordinary actor. So I think mm. there's, you know, there is scope for being reclusive. It's just... I mean, yeah. it helps if you can do events, but it's not essential. Um, Ollie, do you work with some uh, some authors that decide to get to write under a pen name? I do. I do, wow. and sometimes there's there's very good. <laughs> I think we all do. Um, yeah. You know, if, you, if you're a bloke and you want to be writing psychological suspense, a genre which is typically seen as for a female readership, um, you're going to be whipping out those initials or changing yeah. your name to something more feminine um, in order to fit into that market. And that's what happens a lot of the time. Kind of like a, a reverse of what happened in Victorian times, you know? Yeah. Um, wow. And then, yeah. Yeah. Sorry, you, were you going to say? No, and, and then obviously if you're changing genre or if you want to continue writing a series of books in one genre but want to experiment in another without affecting the sales, that's when you would perhaps also use a pseudonym. Mm. Um, and Stuart, is that anything you've ever come across or is it not really something you've experienced in the sort of poetry? So poetry I have surprisingly, I say surprisingly because um, I think there is a feeling about poetry that needs to be kind of honest and actually it's you and it's not something that's separate from you. Obviously it is, um, but there's, there is that honesty thing in poetry where people like to feel that it's really you and the poems are about your life to some extent. Um, I have had that recently and I, I was going to go with it, um, but um, yeah. it, it fell through, so there we are. But I just think I think there's good reason for it, and I still I, and I still feel it will um, make a good book that we can sell. 
and that's fine. But I think going back to the recluse thing, um, yeah, I think I think being in lockdown has helped us all find ways to reach an audience from our homes, um, mm -hmm. if that's what reclusive means. But not engaging with an audience, I think it's very difficult to do. And mm -hmm. certainly the size of publisher we are, we absolutely rely on that from our authors. So it's tricky. Yeah. And, and then we've just come you. to the end, but there was a final question, if you don't mind. Um, regarding non-fiction and platform, it seems a little exclusive if one has to be a prop and so on, so and so, or an Instagram pro. Any other insights on platform? Specifically for non-fiction. Um, yes. Kate? Yeah. Um, so I guess, I mean, with non-fiction, I mean, the, the, is the subject that's paramount. If it's a subject that is of either of perennial interest or sudden of, of or suddenly topical or zeitgeisty in some way then then you you're at an advantage so the, the fundamental thing um is the subject but what what any um retailer therefore any what what any reader therefore any retailer therefore any publisher therefore any agent will want to know is why should we trust you on this subject and that is your platform um, and it you know if it's your own personal lived experience that's why we should trust you um, but if you are trying to if you've written a I mean there have been so many of these now but if you've written a medical memoir you kind of need to be a medic in some way um, so other thoughts on platform um, Just trying to think of something that we haven't touched on already and i think we've, we've largely covered it but i think that's the fundamental thing is once you've sorted out the subject you do need to understand why the reader would trust you would want to know what you have to say on this subject as opposed to me or your neighbor or, or anybody else really so that's your platform yeah it's an important message juliet do you have anything to add on that or final words um, I agree with Kate that you have to be the expert, basically. Um, you have to kind of know what you're writing about or be prepared to investigate what you're writing about, perhaps. It might help if you've published a couple of pieces of journalism and that sort of thing. Um, and the other thing I would say is that where sometimes we can make something work where there's not an existing platform, the publisher will help to build that platform. So the publicity and marketing goes a long way to do that. It's then bringing people to you, but in the hope that people might be finding you already, I think. You have to be discoverable for what you're talking about. And a lot of my nonfiction writers perhaps you know have somewhere online that they can talk to people and talk about what they want to write about yeah and ollie you represent non-fiction writers too so did you have any final thoughts on that or, or just to echo what the others have said i echo um i think everything they've said covers it yeah thank you <laughs> <laughs> Um, so Jason, we haven't really discussed how we were going to bring this to an end, but I did just want to chip in in case I don't get, don't get another opportunity to do so, just to say to everyone here, I hope that you'll just join me in extending a massive thanks to our panellists for sharing Absolutely. their wisdom and expertise with us, Kate, Stuart, Ollie and Juliet, and to thank you all guys for coming. <laughs>